today and welcome you to this conference. It's surreal to present with someone who has been had such a major impact in my life and to share my thoughts on why the advocacy work of individuals such as Temple Grandin and um, Tim Sharp is so important. I've loved animals and nature since as long as I can remember at the age of three. One of my favourite scenes when I was young was to lie in the grass and feel the grass and, and, and lie against the trees. I started reading Dr. Grandin's books at about the age of 13 when I wanted to learn more about how my brain worked and I was increasingly interested in animal welfare issues. Animals in Translation changed my life. It came at a time when it brought me out of a very dark place. Sorry, I'm emotional. And um, it helped me in times when I had few friends and I experienced bullying. I was able to learn about human behaviour and tensions through the animals and individuals such as Dr. Grannon and Tim Sharp taught me how to believe in myself and that my struggles showed that I had unique abilities. I also related to animals' misunderstandings, the way that people talked about them, because I realised that there were some similarities with the autistic world. The ways that we communicate, there are some similarities. And for me, I believe that there's an autistic way of thinking that is very similar to the animal way of thinking. We are detailed orientated. We give authentic feedback. When I'm around the horses, I don't have to worry about them lying to me or talking about me behind my back. They tell me exactly what they feel. <laughs> they don't judge me, they give me unconditional love. And I think um, we're at a time now where the shift is seen from seeing animals and autistic people from neurotypical lens, to seeing them as just different thinkers, not wrong, not defective, just different. I relate to animals more than I do humans, and they help me feel less alone. My passion for animal welfare and animal rights then merged into the autism world for me, and I'm increasingly interested in um, supporting both autistic and animals and even merging the two together. For horses, they helped me because I didn't have to worry about the verbal component and processing words. They are highly sensitive as well, and they react to your internal states. For example, if I went into the paddock when I was highly anxious, often they would push me out of their space, run away, or bite me. So I knew that I was anxious at that point. I also worked with some rescue horses who had high needs, and I needed to be extremely careful with my anxiety regulation. And as a result, my awareness of my internal states, or interoception, improved over time around horses. They also taught me some important things like body language. I noticed that I tended to move back and horses were pushing me out of my space. And with the help of my um, horse instructor, I realised that I did this with people too. They helped me hold my space, gain confidence and believe in myself. I had to learn how to gain respect for the horses because if I didn't trust myself, why should they? And I also think many horses are autistic. <laughs> the animal's way of thinking makes a lot more sense to me. No offence. <laughs> Dogs have been a huge part of my life since about the age of six. I got my first black lab and they've helped me with things like play and flexibility. They've also given me companionship and taught me the true meaning of friendship. They've also helped me with things like proprioception and deep pressure. My rescue Ridgeback also needed deep pressure, she was probably autistic, and she would sit right at the end of my bed on my feet, which helped me stop moving in the night. They give me a sense of purpose, they give me a job, they give me something to get up in the morning for. Sometimes I get frustrated with the training sessions, especially if um, what I was saying was that they weren't understanding. However, I realised that this was a normal part of um, training and that if things were normal, not to go to plan. And it's important that I went at the animal's pace, even though it took me out of my comfort zone. In other words, I learned to put my needs second. Recently, I adopted this gorgeous boy named Benson. He's a chocolate Labrador at 10 months old. With the help of expert dog trainers, they're helping me um, to make my assistant's dog. I'm hoping that with his help, it will help me grow my independence and coping with the outside world, which is often overwhelming. I'm also um, t teaching with positive training methods such as clicker training, uh, which Dr. Grandin talks more about in her book, Animals Make Us Human. No punishment or aversives are used and positive reinforcement is emphasised. It essentially marks desirable behaviour and um, by using a clicker, which I've got here. And so if he does something I want, I'll click it and then I go into my treat bag and get a treat. And then over time it can translate to things like toys, any form of reward. My trainer described it as them getting payment. 
But because Benson had to work out the desired behavior for himself, and then I had to reward him for it, it requires a lot of patience. Sometimes in a 10 minute session, I'd only get two or three um, desired behaviors from him. And I had to learn to be patient with that. I also had to accept and understand that some of his silly behaviors that I found difficult were his processing and emotional difficulties. Somehow that reminds me of myself as well. <laughs> you may have heard a bit about the neurodiversity movement. What does neurodiversity mean? It was actually a term that was coined by autistic sociologist Judy Singer in the 1990s. It describes neurological differences such as autism, dyslexia and ADHD, but moves away from viewing them as deficits, disorders or impairments. It encourages a positive rethink. So many autistic individuals and families are told about their autism from a deficits-based perspective. You can't, she will never, I won't. The neurodiversity movement allows for um, acknowledgement of our strengths and embracing our neurology. This doesn't diminish our struggles, but it celebrates our differences and diversity. It also recognises that neurological differences are a normal variations in the human genome. And to be honest, if everyone was the same in this world, it would be very boring indeed. It encouraged me to change my viewpoint to I will never to I will be. And it encourages us to embrace our passions and follow our dreams rather than trying to correct our deficits. And with this viewpoint, we can embrace our individuality and contribute meaningfully to the community. Autistic voices are so vital in this movement. They give us a sense of hope, success and possibility, especially for us younger autistics who don't know where our journeys will lead yet. Our autistic tribe elders help us feel like we belong somewhere. We don't feel alone or abnormal. And autistic adults we know have a common neurology. I was very lucky to have some autistic adults mentor me when I was younger. And even just saying things like, oh yeah, I, I get that. Or, you know, I've been through the same thing was very comforting, even though we were very different. Mum and I also benefited from autistic adults' perspectives and autobiographies, especially when I was at an age where I couldn't articulate things myself. They have unique insights because they know how it feels to be autistic. And I think by collaborating with the autistic and non-autistic world, we can help change the autism narrative. It encourages collaboration and providing better therapy services, even teaching. And I'm so grateful for the insights of individuals such as Dr. Brandon and Kinshaw. They show what's truly possible when you embrace um, your strengths and how to live a meaningful life. And I hope that you enjoy the day today and take a lot from their insights. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>